In the next couple of weeks, we're going to be speaking about the heart of the Father. And I believe that as we speak about the heart of the Father, the credibility of God that God has with us will be strengthened. You know, as, as we speak about the heart that God has for us, the heart of the Father, how it is revealed in Scripture, the credibility in the goodness and the love of God for us will be strengthened. Um, now, um, just uh, think a minute. Uh, how does God love Jesus? I mean, God loves Jesus with a passion. It's His only begotten Son. And God loves us with the same love that He loves the Son. Now, I mean, in a relationship with a father, we often try to gain the approval of a father by what we do. But with God, we do not have to work to gain his approval because we are his children and he loves us because we are his children. Just think a minute if, if we think of the example of Jesus. Before Jesus had done any work that God wanted him to do, as he got baptized, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So God loved Jesus because He was His Son. Not because He did certain things for God. And the same with us. God loves us because we are His children. Not because uh, we obey certain commands. No. As, as we accept Him as our Father... The same love that God has for Jesus, He loves us with. Um, you know, um, also just think about Jesus as they came into the Garden of Gethsemane to take Him captive. Uh, Peter pulled out a sword and he uh, chopped one God's ear off. And Jesus said to him, don't do that. He said, if I want to, I can pray and my Father would send legions of angels to come to my help. So even as Jesus was obeying the Father by going to the cross, He still had um, the uh, independent decision to make, do I want to go to the cross or not? And even if Jesus had decided not to go to the cross, the Father would have honored that decision. You see, the Father would have sent legions of angels to help Jesus. Why is that? Because He loves the Son. God is not a a slave driver, taskmaster, that has got a certain a task that we need to do and he will drive us to get there. Even with Jesus, if Jesus had decided he does not want to fulfill this task, because God loves him, he would have honored that. And God loves us with the same love, unconditional. So, you know, let's just pray. Lord, thank you that uh, you are our Father that you reveal yourself to us as our Father. Lord, we just pray that you will open our hearts um, to understand what it means that God is our Father. Just to help us to realize that, Lord, to understand the depths of the love that you have for us, the depth of your goodness that you've poured out on us. Thank you, Jesus. You know, just think... Uh, one of these songs that we sung said, I pour my love out on you. But if we realize, if we start to realize more and more the love, the depth of the love that God has for us, it, it awakes, awakens in us a desire to love God. You see, and that, that is our response upon the love of God, the unconditional love of God. It, it awakens a love in us for God, for the Father. Now, um, just take Lynette's uh, example. You know, um, God loves her unconditionally. God has provided for her up to this point and He will provide for her further. Not because uh, she has attained to some level of obedience. No. Because He loves her unconditionally. That is why He will care for her. Why He will provide for her. The same with each one of us. Um, you know, um, if we talk about the heart of the Father, it's often said that people don't realize what it means that God is our Father because of the impression that we have of our earthly fathers. You know, people say that 
if you had a good earthly father, you realize more easily that God is good. And vice versa, if your father on earth was bad to you or whatever, you're going to struggle with the image that you have of God the Father. Now, I would say in a sense that is true, but it's also not true. Because there's, I've listed some points that just highlights why we don't, or why we struggle to understand the heart of the Father. Okay? Because there, there are some uh, uh, foundation things in our lives that cause us to fail to understand the heart of the Father. The first one is, our minds have been filled with lies regarding the character and person of God. I mean, Gerald's testimony just now about a Catholic church. I mean, think of any church, and you think of the lies that are being spoken about God. In Isaiah, it says, um, God says, my name is blasphemed. You know, just think, if, <laughs> if Jesus was alive today, he would have been able to sue a whole lot of people about the lies they've been speaking about his name. And a lot of those lies are being spoken from pulpits by people in the name of God. And yet they're proclaiming lies about the character of God. And we've been hearing those lies for years and years. And it's penetrated our minds. It's penetrated our belief system. So once we start hearing the truth about God, we will be set free from that. The second one is, we do not understand the work that Jesus has done, and we do not understand who we are in Him. So, the extent of the work that Jesus has done has been reduced by people preaching it. By Christians believing in Jesus, they do not understand the full extent of what He has done, and who we are in the completed work of Christ. Now, in the, in the next few weeks, we'll be talking more about these points and expounding on that. Then also our hearts, our belief systems are polluted by works. An evil belief system based on our working for God. So we believe that by what I do, I attain the approval of God. So if I do something wrong, I've lost the approval of God. But that is not true. In Christ, I have the approval of God. God loves me with the same love that He loves Jesus with. A perfect love then we do not understand the love that the Father has for Jesus. The love that the Father has for Jesus is the same love that He has for us. Just think, you know, if we start, especially if you read the Gospel of John, it becomes clear how the Father loves the Son. And we'll be talking about that as well. Now, just see what the next one is. I just want to show you there's a, a very... Uh, clear picture in scripture about the state of man under the law. Uh, if you go, for those of you who's got a Bible here, yeah, if you want to turn to John 12, it would be good. I haven't got these scriptures up on the screen. It would be good if you can read that with me. John 12 uh, from verse 58. Now this is speaking about Lazarus. Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, comes to the grave, the grave of Lazarus. Lazarus is in the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take you away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, said I not unto you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I knew that you hear me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he, was and he that was dead came forth, bound head and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. Now, this is a... Hey? Sorry, John 11. John 11 from verse 58 to verse 44. So, the picture, when I read this last week, 
I realize there has to be more in this picture of Lazarus being risen from the grave than what you can see at face value. And now, it says that um, we have all, we all are dead in our sin and in our trespasses. Ephesians 2 verse 1 and verse 5. All of us were dead in our sin and our trespasses. In the same way, Lazarus was dead. He was in a cave. It's very dark in a cave. You can't see, especially if there's a stone rolled in front of it. Okay? That stone speaks of the law. The law was written on stones. So here is man shut up in a cave, shut up by the law. There's no way that man in that state can see the Father. There's no way that I can get out of that cave to know the Father, to even realize who God is. Man under the old covenant, could not see who God the Father was. And this is why man was shut up in darkness by the law. So Jesus had to come and Jesus portrayed the Father to us. He said to the, the disciples, asked him, uh, Lord, show us the Father. And he said, I, I, I have been with you so long, do you not know me yet? So the Father Answer them. Why? Because the Father was dwelling in Jesus. Jesus came to show us the Father. So here is Lazarus speaking of man shut up in darkness with a stone which is the law. And Jesus tells them, roll away the stone. Jesus fulfilled the law. He took away the law so that we don't have to live by the law anymore. And then Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus come forth. That song we sung in the beginning said, uh, Jesus, I speak your name, mountains move. But you know what? God spoke our names. He spoke our names. He said, come forth. Come forth. He called us forth from the dead, the deadness we were in. We were dead in our sin and in our trespasses. And he called us forth into life, into light, into a place where we can know the love that the Father has, has for us. And it said that as Lazarus came forth, he was bound head and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Grave clothes speak of um, clothes of death. What is that? That is, I clothe myself with my own works to be righteous. And we were clothed in that under the law. It, it only brought death to us. Plus, his face was bound with a napkin. His eyes was closed. He couldn't see. And Jesus said, remove that. 2 Corinthians uh, 3 says that uh, the law is a veil over our faces, that we cannot see the glory of God. So this speaks of a picture of man under the law being set free by Christ. If you read uh, Luke 4, Verse 18, Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So, this is what happened with Lazarus. Just think about it. What the poor, He said, Jesus said He came to preach the gospel to the poor. The poor were those who did not qualify according to the law. They were cursed by the law because they were poor. The law said if you obey the law, you would be rich. They, didn't, they weren't able to obey the law. They were cursed under the law. So Jesus said, I came to preach the good news to those who are cursed, to those who according to the law do not qualify. So I want to say, you know, any person that according to earthly measures does not qualify to be holy or to be a Christian, the gospel of peace is for them. Jesus came to preach to the poor. He says, uh, God has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. In this we see the heart of the Father, that He has sent His Son to do these things. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. What does the heart speak of? The heart speak of our faith system, our belief. Now the belief system of man was broken. It was totally perverted because of the wrong choice that Adam made. So Jesus came to heal the belief system of man, to set it right, to the point that I, I just believe in the completed work of Jesus, the grace of God floods me, 
my belief system is healed. To preach deliverance to the captives, like Lazarus, he was held captive under the law. Jesus came to preach uh, deliverance to the captives, to set the captives free. Recovery of sight to the blind. Lazarus had a cloth for it, and, uh, bound about his head, he couldn't see. Jesus came to take that away. The law made us blind. We, we were blind because we continued in the belief system that said, I have to perform for the acceptance of my Father. To set at liberty them that are bruised. That is what Jesus did to Lazarus. He set him at liberty. If we see this, we see the heart of the Father for us. That he would send his only begotten Son to set us free. To proclaim liberty to us. Now, under the law, uh, people could not understand the love of God. Because their hearts were broken. Their belief system was perverted. Okay? So Jesus had to come to say that right. For example, this verse. Psalm 73 verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Now, if you try to understand that from a law mindset, you are doomed. Because that says, how, how you would read that in a law mindset is you would read it as, God is good if you live a right life. Okay, now that is not true. A heart speaks of a belief system. Okay, my heart is evil, my heart is dirty, my heart is polluted. If I believe that I have to work to attain the approval of God, okay, that is what Jesus said. That is an evil heart, that is a dirty heart. A clean heart is a heart that has been washed from that, a heart that says, I have. The unconditional love of God. I abide in Christ. I have faith in Jesus. The love, the mercy, the goodness of God to me is unconditional because of the work of Christ. If I believe that I have a clean heart and then I will see the goodness of God. So you see, if I abide in a law system of works, I will not see that God is good. I will not experience it. And that is what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to say that right. Now, there's another uh, very good picture uh, in Scripture um, about the goodness of God, the heart of the Father. Um, we're going to start here. Now, initially when we read this, you might say, but how does this uh, um, link up to the heart of the Father? But I'll explain that as we go along. Matthew 12, verse 58 to verse 40 then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he, on, this is Jesus. Jesus answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, uh, Jesus is talking about Jonah. Now, if you look at it at face value, it, it seems very easy to understand. Because as Jonah was three days in the fish, Jesus would be dead three days in the grave and he would rise again. Now, that is true. That is what it speaks of. But there's a, a deeper meaning in uh, the book of Jonah, if you read it. Now, what happened uh, in Jonah? God said to Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach to them. If you don't preach to them, they will die. Okay? Then Jonah didn't want to do it. He got onto a ship. The ship went to Tarsus. A big storm came and it threatened to destroy and kill everyone on that ship. Then they threw the Jonah into the water. The fish swallowed him and he was in the belly of the fish three days. Then he prayed to God. The fish spat him out and he went and he preached to Nineveh and they came to repentance and they were not destroyed. Now, if, if you read uh, Jonah, Jonah speaks of Jesus, okay? Um, the first part is, you, you remember this uh, Hebrew character 853, which is the Hebrew character Olive Tav, okay, speaking of Jesus. So it says, they took up Jonah, speaking of Jesus, and cast him into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. So, um, this is 
Speaking about the death and the crucifixion of Christ. Jonah thrown into the sea. Jesus was killed on the cross. Okay. Now if you read that. The men on the boat. They were in a boat. And a big storm came. They had no escape out of that storm. It says they rode hard to get to land. But they couldn't. So in the same way. Uh, because of the wrong choice of Adam. All of us are set adrift. We do not know who our Father is. We do not know who we are. And the storms of life come against us. And what do we do? We work really hard to get to safety. But we can't do it. Because the storm is raging. We cannot get to safety by our own efforts. By rowing hard, by working hard. What has to happen? Jesus has to die. To bring peace. As Jonah was cast into the sea... The storm ceased. Peace came. And in the same way, uh, when Jesus died, he brought peace. That is what was announced at the, at the birth of Christ. Peace on earth. Peace in the hearts of men. I do not need peace uh, in circumstances to have peace. I have the peace of God in me. You can have the peace of God in the midst of all these circumstances. They can rage around you, but you can have the peace of God because of the work of Christ. The second instance where Jonah uh, speaks of Jesus is, uh, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This speaks of Jesus, as we read in Matthew. Jesus was in the grave for three days and three nights. And the third instance where Jonah speaks of Jesus and the Lord spoke unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. This is the, uh, the resurrection of Christ. Okay? Now after this, it's very interesting, three times it speaks of Jonah as being Jesus. After this, it never says again that Jonah speaks, uh, uh, symbolically speaks of Christ, prophetically speaks of Christ. Then, Jonah went and he preached to Nineveh, and they repented. Now, uh, uh, Jonah 3 verse 10 says, And God saw Aleph Tav, their works, that they turned from the evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. So, what it says there is, the work of Jesus is seen as our work. The work of Jesus, prophetically, Nineveh, uh, accepting the word of uh, Jonah, prophetically it speaks of, the work of Jesus being seen as our work. If we place our faith in Christ, His work is seen as our work. His perfect obedience is seen as our perfect obedience. And no evil would fall upon us from God. Okay? Now, how does this tie up with the goodness of God, the heart of the Father? To understand that, we have to go to Nimrod. Okay? <laughs> Nimrod was the father of Nineveh. Okay? If ever there was a bad guy in the Old Testament, Nimrod was it. Okay? Nimrod uh, was the grandson of Ham, who was the son of Noah. Ham was the um, son of Noah that did not uh, cover his father's nakedness when his father got drunk. He did not cover his father's nakedness. He went and he told his other brothers, and they covered their father's nakedness. To the point that Noah pronounced a curse on Ham's son, Canaan. Okay, so already Nimrod had a disadvantage. Okay, if you're talking about curses, his family was cursed. Okay, the name Nimrod even means let us rebel or rebellion. Okay, man uh, was in a state of rebellion against God. Okay, Nimrod was also the founder of Babel, of Babylon. Okay, and he built the Tower of Babel. Then he left and he founded Nineveh. Nineveh. So, Nimrod is the father of Nineveh. So, uh, let me just read to you. Uh, it says that Nimrod set up a rulership based on personal valor and maintained by aggression. Nimrod set up an empire of conquest beginning with Babel, ever after the symbol of the world power in its hostility to God. He was even worshipped as a god. So, if ever a city was supposed to have a curse on it, Nineveh was it. Nimrod was its father. It was founded in rebellion. It was founded in total disobedience to God. And yet God sent his prophet there. 
can you see the heart of the Father? In the same way, we were in a total state of rebellion against God. Everything we do, everything we believed, was in rebellion against God. And in the state of that total rebellion, total darkness, turning away from the Father, what does the Father do? He sends His Son to die for us. The work of the Son being seen as the work of evil and rebellious men. Scripture says, while we were still the enemies of God, He loved us. In the same way that He chose to love Nineveh, God chose to love the world. To send Christ to die for the world. Yes, I just want to show you that scripture. That's what Romans 5 verse 8 says. But God commends His love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the same way uh, that Jonah went to Nineveh, God sent His Son to us. Now, what is amazing if you look at that word commends. What that word means, that Greek word, word means to place together to set in the same place, to put together by way of combination, which in combination means intimate union, to teach by combining. Combining means uniting closely. So what does that mean? But God commends His love toward us. So God put His love for us in the same place that we were by the work of Christ. It says, to place together. So God put His love for us together with us. To set in the same place. In the same place that man found itself. Hidden away in a cave. God took His love in the form of Christ. And brought it down to us. God the Father. To put together by way of combination. Intimate union. When we believe in Christ, we are born again. We receive the Spirit of God. Intimate union with us. The love of God in the Holy Spirit filling us in intimate union with us. Uniting closely with man. The love of God. Now, let's just take a quick look at who our Father is. God is our Father. Okay, he's the supreme being, the eternal, infinite spirit, the creator, the sovereign of the universe. Supreme sovereign, the highest in authority, the highest power in the universe. So our daddy <laughs> is the highest power in the universe. He has the highest authority. If the person who has the highest authority in the universe says you are okay, you are okay. If he says I love you, you have the love of the highest being in the universe. Hallelujah. You know, just think about it. Um, God is eternal. He's without beginning or end of existence. He's unchangeable. He exists at all times without change. A being, a spirit, a, the most powerful being that he ever will be, who has no beginning, he has no end. He never changes. Yesterday he was good to us, today he will be good to us, tomorrow he will be good to us. This being chose to be our father. Now just stop for a minute and consider who God is. You know, we say so easily God is our father, but we need to stop and consider who God is. He is supreme. He is the highest being in the universe, an all-powerful being, you know, when man receives power, it normally corrupts man. They normally get corrupted. God has ultimate power, but He does not corrupt Him. He does not corrupt Him. He is good. He doesn't see how I can serve my own interest with the power that I have. He doesn't do that. He says, how can I serve the interest of man with the power that I have? God is infinite. He's without limits. He's unbounded. He's not confined. That word unbounded means there's no boundaries. He has no boundaries. You cannot fit God into a box. You cannot do that. You cannot be enclosed within a certain limit.
He is everywhere. He is not confined to a particular place. He is omnipresent. God is everywhere. Everywhere. He is perfect. God is perfect. That's why His power doesn't corrupt Him. He has perfect holiness, which is purity, integrity of character, perfect beauty, love, goodness, mercy, righteousness, and judgment. You know, uh, people in the law often say that people who are in grace who preach the goodness of God do not want to mention that God is holy. Okay? We are not afraid to mention that God is holy. Why? Because the holiness of God, the purity, the integrity of His character means that He's perfectly good to man. That's why we're not afraid to mention it. But if you're in the law and you mention the holiness of God, they immediately see it as the ap total, ap you have to um, totally reject everything that you do that might be seen as sin. So, someone who's in sin cannot come to God. They have to get rid of that sin. That's what they preach and that is wrong. The holiness of God means that God is perfect, perfectly good to people. That God is perfectly righteous to people. The righteousness of God says that Jesus paid the ultimate penalty. I will not judge man based on their sin. I will judge man based on faith. That is the holiness of God. The judgment of God is perfect. God will never judge us based on what we do because of the sacrifice of Christ. He will judge us on what we believe. Do we believe in the ultimate sacrifice of Christ or not? Perfect love. Love that always serves others' interests. That is who God is. Perfect goodness. God will be good to us no matter what we do. No matter what we do, God will be good to us. If we believe wrong, we won't see the goodness of God. Now the word father, if you look at that word, it means someone who exercises paternal care and acknowledges responsibility. So God um, acknowledged responsibility for His creation. How did He do that? How did God care for us? God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. So that is how God cared for the world, for, for His creation, by um, embodying a man. So God joined with His creation in a man, and He paid the ultimate price for the sins of man. That is how God cared for us. I mean, like Bertie has said, forever God will be a man. Jesus will forever be a man. That is how God cared for us. He physically embodied. He became, just think, you know, God is all-powerful, almighty. He's a spirit. He's not bound to the limits of time and space. And now he limits himself into the body of a man. He becomes a man for the sake of his creation. To take care of his creation. That is what he has done. Let's just look at that verse. James 1, verse 17 to 18. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Okay? So, the gift of God to man is good and perfect. In perfection, God is good to us. And comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variables, variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of His own will begot, he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That says that God born us, birthed us with the word of truth. What is the word of truth? <clears throat> Jesus is the word of God. The, when Jesus became a man, we could see the truth of who God is. Because up to that point, man had no idea. So the word of truth is Jesus. When we hear the words that Jesus speaks and we believe it, we are born again into the likeness of God. You know, God, who is all-powerful, gives His likeness to dust. That is what that says. We are the first fruit of His creatures. Now, just think that Scripture says God is a consuming fire. Now, 
what does that mean? God is a consuming fire. But just think about it. My father <clears throat> is a consuming fire. When I believe the word of truth, I'm born again. I receive the spirit of God. But what it also says, um, Luke 3.16 John answered saying unto them, All I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I comes, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Baptism speaks of rebirth. I believe in Christ, I am reborn as a new creation. I receive the intimate union of God in me, the Holy Ghost, I am baptized with fire. So, the same nature that God has, I have. I unite with everlasting fire. God baptizes me with everlasting fire. I have the same likeness as my Father. He dwells in everlasting fire. I dwell in everlasting consuming fire because of God the Father in me. I am like my Father. In intimate union with the Father. You know, if I go through a day, I have no fear of God. He is my Father. I'm not afraid of Him. So, if there's anything that worries my mind, if there's anything that bothers me, I go to my Father. I rest in Him. I fall into His arms. If you read this scripture, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. We're going to finish with the scripture. Now, that word bosom, I wonder if I've got it down here. Yes. Bosom is the front of the body between the arms. The bosom. It also means embrace as with the arms, implying friendship or tender affections. Kindness, favor, implies intimacy, Affection and confidence, an intimate or conf confidential friend. Now, in the same way that Jesus in the, is in the bosom of the Father, we are in the bosom of the Father. During, during the day, if ever you need the care of the Father, you can just see yourself lying down in the bosom of the Father. Total acceptance for you in an intimate relationship with God. When God looks at us, he's, we are His friends. He has tender affections towards us. He is kind towards us. We have the favor of the supreme being of the universe. We are intimate with Him. We have His confidence. God is confident in us. He is an intimate friend to us. He is our Father. Now, this also says that up to that point, before Jesus came, no one had seen the Father. So, in the next couple of weeks, we'll also be looking at that, how Jesus revealed the Father to us, the love of the Father. So, that's it. We're done. So, you know, just, let's just close our eyes. Now, just meditate a little bit on who God is. And that this supreme being, the highest authority in the whole universe, the same God who created the smallest microorganism, who created a whale, who created the elephant, who created the ant that walks in your kitchen, the same God who created a supernova in space, who created Mars, all the planets, the sun, the same God wants to be our Father. This same God loves us with a perfect love. He's perfectly good to us. He cared for us by becoming one of us. The supreme ruler of the universe became one of man. He became one with man. He limited himself to the point where he became one of us. Just meditate on this God who wants to be your father. And that he is perfectly good. His perfect love is perfectly holy. He will never change in his goodness towards us.
Now, if we think of that, just think how we apply that in our lives, our daily lives. The care of our Father for us. We are no longer on our own. We don't have to row hard, to work hard, to get to a place of safety, to get to a place of peace. Peace dwells with us, inside of us. The presence of God, the consuming fire of God. We are joined with God in His consuming fire. We, we are children of fire. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burden, and I will give you rest. And we find rest in the bosom of the Father, knowing that He is intimate with us, that He loves us. Just surrender all your cares, all your worries, all your burdens. Just surrender that to God, God who is our Father. Just let your mind go to peace when you consider the greatness and the goodness of our Father. Thank you, God, that you are our Father. Thank you for the peace that you give to us. We just pray as we walk out, out of here, Lord, that your peace, that we will just keep on meditating upon your peace and that it will dwell with us in our belief system for this whole, for the rest of our lives, Lord. We surrender into the bosom of the Father, into your arms we just Come to rest. We just recline in your arms on your chest, Lord. You are our Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.